beautiful place for the people who want to go and visit Puglia. You can get in touch with Aronzo and they will be help you to organize a very nice trip uh, to the southern Italy. Uh, instead of presenting, introducing to you Aronzo, we'll introduce to you his latest work, which is this. It's the second edition of Tolkien's Library, which has just been published, uh, Aronzo. Uh, this is, uh, I will say, uh, as, um, uh, as Tom Shippey said uh, in the view, very beautiful uh, introduction to this uh, to this to this, uh, uh, to this book uh, it says uh, this is a it is a book which joins a very select group of works the most useful of all a book which will keep updates and write notes in the margin of it for the rest of our lives I think everyone who studies uh, studies Tolkien cannot have a, uh, should cannot but have a copy of this book okay so if you don't have it yet so you can go and buy it on Amazon and uh, it's very cheap I suppose <laughs> that's why I'm fulfilling my role as a, as a promoter of Ronzo's work. So anyway, um, I will leave the, uh, the floor to Ronzo straight away. Uh, let me just emphasize again, this is the third step of a journey into Tolkien's life, into G.B. Smith's life. That's basically what we've been doing today, whereas tomorrow, we, if you want, we'll enter into the collection. Okay, Gradually, starting again from the historical context, uh, led by Stuart, uh, among others, and then uh, in the later sessions of the day in, down into his actual uh, literary work. Thank you very much, Oronzo, for being here. The floor is yours. And uh, thanks again for having traveled away. I mean, for many of us, it is not a long journey. In the case of Oronzo and others, uh, it's been uh, a very, very long trip. Thank you very much, Oronzo. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, just a moment. Okay. O oh, Scholar Grey with quiet eyes, reading the corrupted pages, bright we are one tall candles flickering in line in a torrid chamber under the sky. O oh, Scholar landing granary, have you seen the manifold things you see? Good morning. The lines that I have just read come from G.B.'s poem, Rhyme. Today I, who cannot say to be, I have a grey end, no land in Grammarie, nonetheless will die talking to you about Geoffrey Beige Smith and the few findings of mine concerning him. Now, the hour struck and the neck verse, my neck verse, as a clergy, of the benefit of clergy, must be read. A thousand leaves from one tree, the history of G.B. Smith's poetry, should my paper, paper. In the time available to me, I will focus on some poems by Geoffrey Bash Smith published before being included as Spring Harvest, on differences when the rainy, and then on notes and the references published after the book edited by Tolkien. Furthermore, I will show you some curiosity that I found while searching, a long search, not yet completed. You can be sure that I am not saying the end for it but you not know, afraid. So let you start with him, Joseph Holbrecht, English composer and pianist. When war broken out in 1914, Holbrecht turned his attention invariably, denouncing both the lack of support given to British music and then continued the favor afforded in that of other countries, especially Germany. He published five articles, British Music versus German Music, which appeared weekly in the New Age between the 5 November and the 3rd December 1914. The predilection for German music against English, English music by Olbrecht, also lands in the Saturday Review with an article in three parts. Please. The case against German music, released on October 21st, October 28th, and November 18th. Albrecht pleads the German music, Beethoven and Bach, Wagner, Tour, and Strauss, 
should be given a refreshing rest during the war, and the British composers made it to their beat instead. They used many letters of, of protest that followed the old wrecks at the Rensins, one in particular strike out. Saying on 11 November 1916, the Saturday Review publishes it on 25 March in the letters to editor, it is said by Geoffrey Beige Smith. The whole letter is interesting. This word struck me. We must never let ourselves, ourselves be separated from the mortal tradition in which back was the supreme figure. Your Mozart and Beethoven followed. For so world all, 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 all our music be like a house built on sand. Imagine literature if you will put away forever from your eyes, the Greeks and all they would and did. It is like cutting yourself from the fancy head. You don't even get enough water to wash. Without the past, there can be no future. And this conclusion, take care of the old and the new will, if it is any good, good take care of it itself. As well as the initial part, will you allow me, allow me, an exile in a foreign land? One word on the subject of German music. I suppose that we, young of the Mount Tolkien right at uh, once uh, to Smith and the white man to let uh, them know uh, that he has been shipped home at his in his hospital. He closes his letter to Smith in one to Smith's mother, telling her that her so was well, well set when he last heard from him and asking her to forward his message. 15 November 1960, Mrs. Smith writes to thank Tolkien for his news and says that she will forward his letter to her son. 16 November 1916, Smith has received Tolkien's letter. He is delighted to hear that Tolkien is still alive, if you wish, and in, in it as you are bound to be, to be. He hopes to get to live soon and will visit Tolkien and hear it. For the moment, he is the adjutant of his battalion now camped near the village west of the Dulon Arras Road in France. Valuable insight for the work of Christina Skoll, a way name on the chronology, without which many of her studies called not even begin. Smith, therefore, brought the letter to the Sander, Center de Review with there, camped there near, uh, near the village of Soastre on the Dulon Arras Road. On November 29, 18 days later, Smith will be wounded and on December 3, 3rd, he will lose his life. The Saturday Review article with his love of music will be the last piece of his that Smith would see in print. As it is well now, A String Hours was published in June 1918. Smith collection of poems edited mainly by Tolkien, who wrote a short introduction signed by J.A.R.T. I will not deal with the book, but with some poems in their original form, before being, being included in the 1918 collection and their variations. Wind Over the Sea was published on December 1912 in the King's Edward School Chronicle. To Henry Severo Cicero was published in July 1915 in King's Edward School Chronicle. Aere Perennius, written on commemoration Sunday, October 18, was published on 6 November 1914 in the Oxford Magazine and on 2nd of December in the Queen's Journal under the title The Immortal Dead. The version published in a spring harvest is that of Oxford Magazine while the version, version in wins and some differences. Ave to attack ave atque vale was also published in the Oxford magazine on the 4th of December 1914 and has minor variations 
from the version in a spring harvest. Oh, one came down from Seven Hill, published in the spring harvest, appeared in the Pelican Record magazine, and the sun variation in punctuation a wood. Song of the Downs and Sonnet were published respectively, respectively in Oxford Poetry 1915, which also included Stolke's Goblin Feet, in the Pelican Report of June 1916. About the songs on the Downs and the Goblin Feet, both poems were mentioned in a review written in New Age, a weekly review of politics, literature, and art of March, of March 1916. Poem published in June 1916, the Pelican Record was then incited without changes in a spring harvest while the version printed in Marcus Clapham's book, the Wandsworth Book of First World War Poetry, 1995. There are two variations in the uh, variation in the text. Ah, uh, yeah, we go to the misgot. The poem published in a string harvest under the title Domo Reddit Poeta was entered under the title The Return in Windows Magazine on January 1917. Well, the burial of Sophocles will be published in 1936 by Frederick Zivi in his Valian Muse, an anthology of poems by poets killed in the world war. Here I have reproduced only the first part, which has small variation. In this, a telephone. <laughs> in telephone. <laughs> in, the, in his, uh, yes, in his introduction, Tolkien explained that the poems of this book were written at very various times, but order in which they are given is not chronological beyond the fact that the third part contains only poems written after the outbreak of the war. In the, 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 in the third part, the one which for Tolkien contains the poems written only after the outbreak of war, 1914. That is the poem, that is the word our father left us. Actually, this poem dates back to a list in the year before the war broke, uh, broke out. The March 1913 issue of Wales, the national magazine for the Welsh people, the poem is published with the title to add to the ancient heroes of the Camry. The poem published in Wales has come as some variations in capitalization and differences in words. Standards of other poems published in a spring harvest were later published within the Smith page of Arthur St. John Edgar's book for Remembrance, so the poets we have fallen in the world of 1918. It is interesting now to see how the spring harvest was, re uh, was uh, received by the press of the recent publication, now to unsighted review, review or real interest. First, the month following its publication, the Times Literary Supplement featured it. The review of the Times Literary was then taken up again on the on the 11 and um, 12 October of the same year by the newspaper The Australian. Second, in December 1918, the Old Edwardian Gazette also a lengthy review. Here I highlighted the same interesting passage from both articles. Article. The details of the account in the likelihood by, uh, betrays Tolkien's authorship of the article, but it is a noted way uh, to go in research. It is also not a treat. A treat. So the two review, the important review for a uh, uh, spring harvest. Is a is a, a passage. 
In June 1919, the Pelican record also the lengthy review signed by Alexander Dennis Bennett Brown. From 1947 and 1966, he was secretary of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. A review also appeared in the French newspaper Merc Mercure de France of March 1, 1919, signed by the French literary critic and translator Henri Durand d'Avray, who writes so the canon was come to take away his calm happiness, his friends, and the romantic nights of his imagination. The second stanza of the poem, Intestational, was published under the title A Soldier Prix in 1925 in Book 4 and 5, The Book of Reverence for Twiddle by Clement de Brace Gunn. In children's new papers, of, the, of October 1959. Two months later, in the Advocate newspaper of December 1989. And again, in Children's newspaper of February 1942, in Tistanza of Atwe Valley. Now, we all know the famous photograph of Smith in the uniform of the Lancashire Fusilist. While researching this talk, I come across a photo of Smith in uniform that I never seen before. And then doing some research, I, don't, I did not find it in other publication. The photograph was published in August 1980, issue of the Bookman. Both photographs were taken by some of Oxford, but are different from each other. In the now, in the no uh, one, Smith has the left arm bent on the side, while in the second, the arm runs along the side. The tilt of the head is also different. It's the same photograph. John Gart, thank you so much for all of John. <laughs> John Gart, in his outstanding studies uh, talking in the Great War writes, GBS it with conventionalist and the light in the fact that she initial uh, with George Bernard Shaw, the great debate uh, of the age. The same concept uh, there is in the old Weathers Gazette, as John Gatter already said. Smith was pleased that his initial match show. But we know how the TCBS he would have reacted if the page came to learn that Smith's line, so way lie, so, so way lie down the pen, would be attributed, attributed to show. In 1963, in his and not yield and out of the biography, Ella Winter, an Australian British journalist and activist, writes, My mind repeat Bernard Show war lines. <laughs> Again, Frederick Wetton, who was a German-American psychiatrist and author, in his assigned for Kane, an exploration of human violence, 1966, writes, a contrasting response of art to the actual phase of violence is shown by Bernard Shaw. At the same time, that Thomas Mann began his war writings, namely, at the very beginning of the First World War, Shaw sent a po poem to a newspaper. No, they're not sure, but Jibby Smith. Concluding, I thank you for your attention. I've tried to do a service to the memory of a young man to whom, uh, to whom we owe a lot. Though in this place, speaking to you today, in the most beautiful way I could receive in these years of studying to Tolkien. Indeed, to quote from Smith, Right again. I think we all feel like the man who finds the night and the chase ch ch in sea, the years gone by and the years to be. It that searches with tireless sire in a torrid chamber under the skies, so that we may also know passion and joy and sorrow and the laughter, life and death, and think thereafter. I leave you with a poem I've written in late 1914 
and publishing the Pelican record. For this, I thank Beppe Pezzini and Sarah Watson at Corpus Christi College for helping me my find, find this precious testimony. This poem was not included by Tolkien in a spring harvest. I don't know why. To some of you, like, Ad like Douglas Anderson and Joe Gart, it's perhaps already now, but I want to conclude with these lines, probably written by Smith at the Council of London, 1914, because uh, the poets uh, published it in uh, March 1914, 15 because his word bring to mind to for young men a group that was destined to kindle a new life, or what is the same thing, rekind, rekind, rekindle an old life in the world, seeing as you today and talking about what we love. I can tell that the spark is indeed engaged and will never go out. Thank you so much. Corpus Crisis. Thank you, Beppe Pezzini, for the hospitality. Thank you all for the attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aronso. I think that was very useful to start tracing the history of the collection of Spring Harvest, OK? Um, I also again have a few questions, okay, but uh, I would like to open the floor first, please. Yes, uh, thank you so much. It was very nice to listen to you. Um, the poem New Year 1915, do you know why it wasn't included in the last spring harvest? I don't know. Mm. John? No, no idea. I mean, it's a beautiful No idea. It's a beautiful, no. beautiful piece. Mm. Real it's a beautiful it's poem, but uh, I don't know because uh, Tolkien not published it. You know, there are distortions in the, in the, in the letters of the body that Tolkien kept um, between, between Tolkien and Wiseman, and basically Tolkien and Wiseman's letters because Tolkien's never survived. Um, Wiseman talks about, you know, let, let's not make a complete edition of everything you wrote. Let's make you an edition of all the good things you wrote. But that doesn't explain that either. They might have had different tastes. Well, they may, they may have done. I mean, Wiseman was an avar of tin, avar of tin pan wall, so <laughs> arguably told things worse than a poet. So, uh, you know, over the hoops, over the hoops. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. Two ups, please. Well, I, I was just going to wonder if, they, if, they, if there's any chance they didn't know about it. Because there's that page in the manuscript that has the table of contents of Spring Harvest, and there's a lot of poems crossed out which they didn't want. And I've only, I mean, I've only had a chance to look at it once, but I don't remember this. Mm. It may have been they just referred to it the first slide. You would have think they'd known about it, but it, I don't remember seeing it on that table of contents. The, the, so the poems that they used, I believe, came from Smith's mother. Mm -hmm. So it would have been a matter of what she had uh, say collected and what he left. I have a question on this, just because we really delved into the history of the publication. What was the role exactly of the mother? Okay, so what did the mother ask Tolkien and Wiseman? What did she want to publish, and uh, uh, how did they? In a sense, what and also what is actually Wiseman intervention? Okay, because at the end of the day, we also see the sigla of JRT. We don't find any reference to Wiseman. Why is that? Why Tolkien took uh, credit uh, almost on his own for the work, even if we know that somehow Wiseman was, was involved? The Wiseman is the only people, only person with Tolkien uh, that return the world. The, the mother is a, a, a ruler of the mission and uh, the support uh, by talking for the, the book. I don't know how other uh, the letter or the communication talking the mother. Well, I can only talk from, from memory because I, I haven't looked at those letters for a while. Um, but my memory and impression is that um, 
Ruth Smith spoke first of all to um, the former King Edward School school teacher, um, R.W. Reynolds. Mm. Um, and the conversation seems to have arisen there about producing a book of Smith's poems as a you know, suitable memorial very early on after his death. Um, that seems to have happened before either Tolkien or Wiseman were involved. Um, and then the impression I get is that um, for all that Tolkien respected Reynolds' uh, opinions in many ways, um, to the extent that he wrote the first version of the film really on, mm -hmm. as a way of explaining the background of, of his poem, The Lay of the Children of Hood, to Reynolds in 1925. Uh, um, uh, they were the, the TCDS as a group were wary of Reynolds and his influence, um, and perhaps they tried to gently wrest the project out of Reynolds' hands. Uh, as to why Wiseman's name is not on there, um, I, I would guess Wiseman's modesty. Um, yeah, in fact, John, what you were saying about the Weissman and talking, what well, he takes away from Dickie Reynolds, um, the letters quoted the Skull and Hammond, as far as I remember, and Weissman is actually the same to talking. If we let Dickie do it, then he will present um, Jeffrey as a poet, as a protege, something like that. Mm -hmm. We want to present him as the man we knew. Mm -hmm. Surely that, um, that affected their choice of poets. It wasn't so much the poets being, being the poets they wanted to put across, which you like the genuine, um, perhaps TCPS principles, even, that might lie behind it. I don't know. That's mm -hmm. what, that what I deduce. From, uh, from what Wiseman wrote at that point. So Wiseman quite critical of some of Smith's later verses as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And also think that in the, one of the reviews quoted by Ronzo, it is a, which again you didn't speak more about it, but we had a long discussion about this just last night. And Ronzo thinks that if I can quote you that uh, at least one of them was actually authored by Tolkien himself or by Wiseman. Because the way the, the reviews are written, uh, especially this sort of self-referential uh, uh, allusion to the um, uh, to the JRRT thing is something that Aronso has found out to be also yeah. in other articles written by Tolkien or Wiseman in the in the um, uh, in the old Edwardian Gazette as well. There is something some stylistical patterns uh, which you think uh, suggest that these were actually offered by Tolkien or by Wiseman. Oh, right. And in that respect, I think it's intriguing to note that one of these reviews, I think this very one, there is an explicit criticism of the second half of the collection, okay? So the second half of the collection, the one collecting the poems written after the war, I don't remember exactly yes, where, in, um, in another one, it is said it's not of the same quality yeah. of... Uh, think this is the Times Literary Supplement. This is on, the Times Literary Supplement. Yeah. And you also think that this may have been... Written right on a scene was summer hymning, the southwest wind, the reviewer. Yeah, that's one. Uh, so also there is a, here the fact that uh, it is given the precise context of writing. Okay, the very moment uh, the summer, a warm summer evening. Okay, strongly suggested the person writing this review was there, or at least knew knew Smith very very well. Uh, and there is the other one where you said where the yeah. criticizes is the, the second yeah. half of the collection. Do you remember? Yeah, that's the initial, but the critical, which is from the part of the yeah. well, I found it very interesting. It's a criticism of the, of the, yeah. of part of the... I don't know. The um, Arturian bishop... Uh, yes, the, yeah. 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 It is cool. Ah, it's cool. Like the other, yes. Uh, oh, there was. Where these readers to us, the last poem is at the end, written after the outbreak of war, uh, seem to have lost something of the rare quality of the other pieces. They find it intriguing that uh, the Wiseman's uh, the criticism of the latest poem that Swell was referring to 
seems to require similar to this view, okay? So maybe, again, we are speculating yes. here that maybe Wiseman and Tolkien or both of them together uh, were behind these reviews, okay? It's interesting. Yeah, this is speculation. Please. Do we know who wrote that review in the... No, they are anonymous. They're not, they're all anonymous. No, anonymous. In the Times of the Literary and Old Edwards Gazette, they're anonymous. Can we sometimes sort of uh, identify by style? The we try to do that, yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> this cool. is the Old Edwards Gazette, uh, the introduction to this lender volume page, the pathos of the promise that they never to come to follow them. Yeah, these are the passages selected by your author that seem to suggest yeah. uh, some sort of close connection. Or, or Tolkien or Wiseman, I don't know what. Especially Wiseman, yeah, here is uh, as the war unfolded, it's almost a claim one after another, his close friend is victims. Okay, there is some, again, perhaps I'm reading here, but there is some sort of a closeness. Uh, a new line for research. <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe. It is, uh, John. For you. Get for you. For you. It's a speculation. I read a few times that they are very, very intriguing, very interesting. Because they provide some sort of almost an internal criticism. That's kind of the criticism we would expect in an editor. Okay. Not just a review of a in a job. It's Sorry, uh, one, two, three, no. first, and then the well, it's it's observation that they, they got it wrong, didn't they? Because as you pointed out, the chronology is all over the place. Mm -hmm. So what was it that they told him to think, or Weissman, or both, that the poems in section three were all written after the outbreak of war, knowing full well that one of them in section two was written after yeah. in 1915, John pointed out. So the, so there must be something, some evidence that we haven't seen that dates those poems in section three of Tolkien's mind, at least. To the, to the yeah, I, I know. My explanation would be that there was some sort of, a, let's say, manipulation okay, in order to put the kind of poems that they like the most in the first section and the poems they like the least in the second section. So either that is, either it was just a mistake, or if we accept the idea that uh, in their mind the poems written uh, in the final stage of Jimmy Smith's life were somehow of a lesser quality than the other ones, then in a way to play a bit with the chronology will kind of fit in with this project. Okay, maybe I'm completely wrong, okay, but I, I do find this is interesting. Okay, could they really get their chronology wrong? Okay, or there is some sort of editorial uh, purpose behind this. And it seems to me, apart from the Burial of Sophocles, for, uh, the Burial of Sophocles but it seems quite to me that there is a coherence. Uh, thematic coherence between the different parts. Okay, it's not just chronology there. And maybe this reflects something of, Tom, of Smith on uh, poetic and human development, okay? Or maybe they reflect uh, Wiseman and Tolkien's own narrative, is a narrative of the way they saw his friends developing in those years. But sorry, please, uh, Christopher and Grace first. Um, uh, the question I had about the, uh, the quote you had from the children newspaper, what would bring that back up? Uh, okay. um, so that, um, well, the question I had was, um, I, I, I came across this publication in some, some research that I was doing, but how, how, how did you find that quote there? Was, was it a case of looking for the po poetry, searching for the actual lines of the poem, or searching for his name? No, only the poetry or by George Besmet in, in, in an article or your children. Under under the the, art, the article on children, uh, the journal uh, uh, printed the uh, only the the poem the yeah. poem of Joseph. How, how, how did you find it? it? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, link, um, Geoffrey, uh, the Australian journal, yeah. the, the the Australian uh, quoted. Uh, the poet, the, the Jib Smith in the new the Oxford new paper. I read uh, all children's new paper. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, and uh, I found uh, this. This and another. And then another one, yes. This is an um, advocate. Okay. And this yeah, is uh, another children's new paper, 1942. 
because I read uh, 1915. Oh, uh, key, keywords. Keywords, yes. I, I only on uh, all part of the poems in the Spring Harvest. I in internet. Google. Google. <laughs> and uh, yes, and uh, all lines, one bomb uh, word, uh, Geoffrey Beige Smith, Smith, Geoffrey Beige, Geoffrey Beige Smith. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have, 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 you, have you tried that for, for the other poems? Yeah. So, yeah, all for the collection. They, they, they all, I, th all I think he has done it for the other collection, yes. Yes, 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 I think that's... <laughs> My name is Sherlock Holmes. Please, guys. <laughs> Say the same, <laughs> John Gart. <laughs> all right, first, um, thank you so much for finding another very rare photograph of Jeffrey Bush Smith. Ah, okay. Really wonderful. Please. Um, did you say that it was by yes, the book. photographer, but just in a different, because they take many different shots in one. Sure. Sessions, so it's no, no, it's just the photo is the same. Sounds Oxford, and uh, this is the 19 uh, August 1918. Mm -hmm. wow. I'm, I was I, I, I'm supposing that you haven't found this yet, but there's a reference in one of the reviews to uh, him publishing in the Westminster Gazette, which is a very well known London periodical. I'm wondering uh, if you, I suppose you haven't, because you wouldn't have included, you haven't included it. There's another so reference. Yeah. One of his poems was published there as well. Oh. And I, I would presume that there could be still more newspapers and periodicals that have his poetry, but I think a lot of it. Oh, okay. But uh, yeah, that would be one to, to look into Westminster because that it is actually named in one of the one of these reviews, I think it comes out of the Oxford Gazette for one of his. Can I just make a quick point? I mean, just all praise to both of you for finding material on Smith that I've never found, you know, because I, I've always felt myself at the bottom of that, not always, but there was a long phase after I finished writing Falcon the Great War where I was still pretty much obsessed with finding out more that I ought to have put in the book, you know. Um, hence the research into Smith's genealogy and so on, but um, no, I, I didn't go down these routes at all. And it, Really rich stuff. Yeah, the photographs. Thanks. Um, just, just a couple more. I think uh, as more things get get digitised, um, yes, uh, you, you should just do re redo the searches, yeah. and, and you'll pick up more more stuff if they come on with. Any other questions? Yes. Well, obviously, I mean, the, the title is Spring Harvest. Is uh, ex the must have been. His own title <coughs> his collection because he the two the, the the all the poems inside are bracketed by the unt untitled first one and the one so we lay down kind we make explicit references to harvest but however the the title <coughs> makes makes it metaphorical because who has been harvested during that spring of the of, of, on the in the springtime of the 20th century mm -hmm. but those those millions of great people amongst whom those uh, the, the people we're talking about here but what's interesting is that i can't remember who if it was john or you who said that the uh, so we laid down the pen was dated from before the war or was yeah, it during the war <coughs> because i mean it's, it's obviously a time it's, it's refers to War events. No, I, I assume it's like you mean. Uh, but uh, but I, if I check in, I, I've always assumed that that type is, is a, a, a probably a Tolkien type, a, a Tolkien Western type, mm -hmm. um, a spring harvest, um, because it wraps things up so beautifully. Um, and you know, you can you can see Tolkien using phrases like that in Lord of the Rings, actually. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I forget the, the, the example I heard recently on the old audio. But, but, you know. Any other comments, questions? Or the fight, otherwise, I think we can conclude here our second session and thank again our answer for this great paper. So, uh, just one thing before we move, I think uh, it's a journey if you want this conference and it's already happening. What, uh, where we're expecting this collaboration is happening. I think this is just fantastic. That's the whole point. Uh, 
while we are here together to exchange views and working together like that. We'll continue to do this uh, later tonight uh, for the people who uh, are for the dinner, uh, register for the dinner. We'll have dinner at 7.15 with drinks at 6.45. So we have about uh, 40 minutes to relax, to get changed if you want to get maybe more dressed. Uh, as I was saying, there is no black tie code, but a bit more smartness would be would be fine if you can. No, no I don't really mind too much, but sorry. <laughs> Of course, of course, more than that, more than that. Can I have my, my... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing there? So, John was well, something. something. Yeah, John, John said something important to add. Which was... give the yeah, 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 we do it straight away. Before John does it, in a way, gives us his final uh, treats of the day. So, oh, okay. 6.45, uh, we are going to meet uh, in, a, in the Reynolds room, which is just in front of the auditorium. So, when you go out, you will see that there is a room in front of it on the left. There will be the drinks reception at 6.45, uh, and then we we'll go to dinner afterwards. Just to clarify, the dinner is just for the people who register for it. So for the other people, uh, uh, we'll see you tomorrow morning uh, at, uh, I think, 9.15. Then we start tomorrow, the third session at 15. So before we go, uh, uh, John is so generous to give us a final treat. Uh, so let me... Gravy. Uh, <laughs> uh, which, yeah. one, which one? Which way would you like to... Way down. down. Oh, oh. down. So... Mm -hmm. There, that level. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thank you again. Um, this I was prompted to, to throw myself up here again uh, by the discovery of that photograph. Um, so again, thank you, Alonso. That's marvellous, because this bit is all about photographs, um, and it's a cautionary tale for researchers um, and an embarrassment for me, um, which I'd love to share. So uh, those of you who read Tolkien in the Great War when it first came out may recall that there was a photograph uh, in, in the um, picture section of G.B. Smith as a schoolboy. Um, and I wanted one in there because there was, there was a great photograph of the other three members of the TCBS. They were all in a single photograph of Measures House, the, 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 the school group that was... Um, uh, run by the teacher, Mr. Measures. So this I took to be a picture of G.B. Smith um, in uh, the school's Greek play, The Frogs by Aristophanes. And I did it because, uh, as you'll see, um, he's listed there uh, on the back, G.B. Smith, um, and, and, and there he is at the end of the row, standing there. Um, and a face, right? Doesn't it look similar? Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, then, in my ongoing research, after I'd finished Tolkien in the Great War, um, I once again visited the family of Rob Gilson, who were really generous with allowing me access to Gilson's papers. Um, and these were in uh, Rob Gilson's father's papers. Rob Gilson's father was the headmaster of King Edward's school, Robert Carey Gilson. And there he is uh, with the beard there, peeking through that hole in this piece of paper. And it's a most bizarre artifact because it's a photograph of prefects um, taken in July 1912, school prefects uh, with the headmaster. Um, and he's covered it in a piece of paper and labeled them. Right, well, okay, so that's logical enough. But there's an extra figure in there. Right, at the right, next to Wiseman. <laughs> whose face is not cut out and labeled. And I recognize that face as being the face of the guy in the photograph of the frogs by Aristophanes. So I went to the King Edward School Chronicle, which lists the prefects for that year. Um, and they all match up with the exception of uh, Vincent Trout, who was an early member of the TCBS group, um, a, a bit like Smith, I think, but he died um, in January of the following year. Um, so he wasn't around for this photograph. And then 
you tick the others off and you're left with Sidney Barraclough, who was also a member of the wider TCBS, um, who by, by uh, the time um, November 1914 came around, had annoyed Christopher Wiseman so much that he wanted to eject Barraclough and most of everyone else from the group which is why we ended up with the immortal four. <laughs> so I'm intrigued to know why the headmaster thought that Barraclough's face, perhaps he was annoyed by Barraclough as well um, and didn't want his face showing. Uh, but there, there, there he is side by side and you can see that you know, the resemblance is absolute and I've seen more photographs now of Barraclough. He, he features quite prominently in a lot of King Edward's school photographs whereas G.D. Smith does not. So I'm afraid that um, this is the true <laughs> Jeffrey Bates Smith <laughs> as he appears in that photograph from Aristophanes yeah. and the Frogs. Um, and maybe, you know, no wonder he was, he was, he was, what, was he hiding or was he showing off? I don't know. That's, this is the, shows the mystery of Smith. Um, he had just appeared in the French play, so he was obviously good at French, uh, playing a part in Racine's Les Plaideurs, um, and gave a characteristically energetic interpretation of his part as Petit Jean. Um, so one last thought is, I wonder if Smith is in this photograph, which was found a few years ago by the then archivist of Canberra School, Alison Wheatley, um, and she marvellously managed to identify Tolkien in there and emailed me one morning to see, to, to, to see if I agreed that it was him. And I, did, um, I, I had enough photographs of Tolkien so that I could examine his ear, specifically <laughs> his right ear, uh, which I realised was quite a distinctive shape and, and confirmed to my mind absolutely that uh, there in the middle of the front row is Tolkien uh, sort of gawping her. Like that, at the audience. Um, and I'm pretty, pretty sure that right next to him is Christopher Wiseman, although that's an uncharacteristic expression for Wiseman. Like that. Um, and I know absolutely for certain that that's Gilson, bottom right. Um, I'd recognise him anywhere. Very, very distinctive features. But what about the guy uh, at the other top corner? You know, uh, and putting that side by side with Smith, could it be the same boy, same man. Um, I'm sure it's not Sidney Baraclough. The ages are extremely fruitful because of course G.B. Smith is three years young. That's the problem. So this photograph is 1907. Smith would only have been 13 years old. And that to my mind, well, it would depend on how he developed. You know, if he was a fast developer, maybe. If he was a slow developer, you know, maybe he's one of these. You know, these are these are other you know similar faces, faces that you know you can just about imagine might have grown up into that that face we see there. Um, so you know, I have no answer here. Um, there's no list of names that goes with that photograph. Uh, I don't even know whether Smith was in the school uh, cadet corps at that point or ever. So um, I, I leave you with that one. <laughs> But just before we go, I remind you of the people who registered for the dinner, drinks at 6 45 in the Reynolds room. One of the conference attendants is Nina, all of that, she does talking guides in Oslo, okay? And she has offered to give a guide tomorrow at 1 45 after lunch. Tomorrow we'll have lunch at 12 45, and at 1 45, she will give a half an hour, 35 minutes tour. So if you're interested in that, you can go and have a chat with her now when we go out. Just a hello who may be interested. It will be a good one before the next session. And you may visit Merton College, Tolkien's College, which is just literally next door. So we'll have an hour with enough for those of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And from the others, it's UC 45. Thanks again to everyone. Thank Thank you.